Hi, my name is Bill Kranz. I'm an irrigation specialist with the University of Nebraska located at the Haskell Ag Lab near Concord. In this section, we're going to talk about how managing subsurface drip irrigation systems can be important to minimizing nitrate leaching into the groundwater supply. To start with, the subsurface drip system is, a, is a different than most of the irrigation systems that we have out there. In terms of the amount of components or different uh, things that we have, if we start with the pump supply or water supply here in the upper right hand corner and we go, uh, we're going to have our backflow prevention device that we have for most of our systems. Uh, we're going to want to have a flow meter here because, of, and I'll get back to this in a little bit, but we want to know how much water is moving through this system. It's also important that we have a pressure gauge located both on upstream uh, and the downstream of our filtration system. And the important thing is here is that when the, the uh, difference in pressure between this one, the inlet and the outlet gets to be uh, decreased so much, then we know that we have to, to basically flush our filtration system out or replace the filter altogether depending on the system. Then we move into our, our, our actual subsurface drift system and we have submains that transport water uh, to various parts of the field. Then we have our individual zones, would be a series of, of furrows here uh, or drip tapes that water uh, is pumped into and, and basically then comes out of emitters into the soil itself. Um, at the down end side of the field, it's important that we have a flush line, uh, the ability to flush these systems out so if we get any silt or, or other deposits forming in these uh, drip lines, we can flush that out and uh, reclaim some of the, the operation uh, efficiency of the system overall. Now, we look at the situation here with the uh, drip system. Uh, Water is going to come into our drip line uh, in the, from left to right here, uh, and there's a hole in, in the uh, tape, and you can see there's three water or white drops here, or white circles. Uh, this is water coming out through an emitter, or basically it's a, it's a measuring device that's going to cause water to come out and move through this zigzag uh, labyrinth here, uh, and eventually it's going to come out of the area down over, over here. So we have this zigzag flow pattern uh, and the water is going to exit at a certain rate over here uh, on the right. Uh, when you buy them, uh, you're looking at, this happens to be a, a picture from a, a spool of Netafim, uh, but by and large you buy these that are rolled up on a spool. They, they lay flat on the spool uh, so they can get uh, several thousand, usually about 4,000 feet or so uh, on one of these spools. And this is in a large version of the um, the labyrinth that I was, was talking about up, up here. Uh, and the idea here is that the emitter is going to deliver a certain number of gallons per hour per 100 feet of this tape. So it might be 0.26, it might be 0.29 gallons per hour per 100 feet of row. So this is the way we design the system. If you divide the, the uh, acre by uh, the spacing of your crop, you can determine how many feet a row and therefore know how many emitters you're going to have at a certain spacing out there in the field. The actual emitter itself is selected based upon soil texture. Um, the ones with a sandy soil will have larger uh, capability for larger kinds of openings than the silt loam soil because of the way the water moves in the soil itself. Now when we install these out in the field, it's very important that we get the spacing between uh, these rows to be uh, uniform. So what we're doing then is we're going to have this, app, uh, this uh, basically knife rig here that you can see the rows of, of uh, drip line attached to the back uh, of each one of these. Uh, and we're going to use a tractor here that has a GPS and auto steer so that we can be precise about the spacing of these particular systems on the field. And regardless of whether you use a three or a five row rig, you're still going to have guest rows between these passes out in the field that the auto steer is going to be very important uh, to uh, make sure uh, that they're in a straight line. And the reason again is because we're going to have a crop row uh, that I'm going to show you here. Uh, the situation is right here uh, where we have a drip line that's buried in, in the, out there in the field and these two rows of the crop, whether it's corn or soybeans or some other row crop, are going to have equal access to this water that comes out of this emitter. Typically they're going to be buried somewhere between 12 and 16 inches deep. Uh, with silt loam soils it's largely 14 to 16. Uh, with the sandier soils it may be uh, advantageous to go 12 feet or 12 inches. The idea here is that the position of these drip tape uh, is below the tillage zone. So we can go through here uh, with most any of our tillage equipment and this drip line is going to be out of harm's way. 
The other part of this is that these, the drip lines, and these are set up for a 30 inch uh, spacing of the crop, uh, and so the spacing between drip lines here, in, uh, positioned out in the field, uh, is 60 inches. So every other row, uh, furrow irrigation using drip line, uh, if you will. Uh, but you can see here now that these two rows of, of uh, corn uh, have ac equal access to this drip line. The last part of this that's not shown anywhere else in these diagrams is there's the spacing of the, the emitters on the drip line as you go uh, down the field is usually going to be somewhere between 18 and 24 inches between uh, emitters. Uh, and you can get uh, a range of anywhere from 12 to 24 or so uh, inch spacings between these emitters on, on the drip tape itself. Here's a look at the control valves that allow us to provide water to four, uh, and actually there are, there are three, three back here in the back as well, so there's seven or eight particular zones here. So these would be areas out in the field that are going to get water for a period of time that's controlled by a, a controller uh, and, and these hydraulic valves that you see pictured here. Filtration is critical, uh, and depending on the flow rate of your uh, irrigation system, uh, you may in fact have uh, a fairly large setup of, uh, for, the, for the filter itself uh, that's, that's out there. The idea here again is we absolutely have to keep material out of these drip lines that might plug that emitter. If you remember back a couple slides, that's a very small outlet coming out of there, and it doesn't take a whole lot to plug it up, and so these filters are essential. They're not an option, they're, they're essential to maintaining the longevity of these irrigation systems. When they're installed then, uh, these are the flush lines at the end of the field. Uh, you can see that uh, the drip lines come out here and, and go vertically downward uh, into the uh, flush line. That's going to be more of a flush line lateral kind of approach. Uh, and there's a valve here that we can turn on and off manually. Uh, there's an air relief here to make sure that it doesn't uh, get a lot of, of uh, air buildup in these lines. Uh, and what it allows us to do again is to flush these systems to make sure that we get all the uh, debris out of them over time. Now if you look at this in the soil, this is the way it looks and just off the top of this picture is the soil surface. Uh, so this is buried down you know, 12 to 14 inches and if we irrigate with these for a period of time, we're going to get this kind of pattern that you see here um, where we have kind of a, a bulb. Uh, that is going to go outward. And depending on the soil it, uh, texture itself will determine how far uh, to the right or to the left from this particular uh, drip line this pattern will go. Uh, more sandy soils are not going to have nearly this wide of a pattern. Uh, and again you see that we're buried down in here and we've actually exposed a section of this drip line that's buried down in the ground. Now when we're doing this in terms of monitoring the system and uh, trying to determine when we're going to irrigate next, uh, we want to do the same sort of scenario that we do with our other kinds of situations. Uh, install these uh, soil water monitoring equipment in the crop row. Um, there's been some work done uh, in Florida and elsewhere basically that would suggest that the key place here, the best place, is about 25% of the spacing between these two. So you think about how we're doing this at 60 inch rows, 25% um, is 15 inches and so we'd be with a 30 inch spacing we'd be right in the corn row, uh, right in the soybean row, uh, whichever crop you might be looking at. And again we want to measure soil water content particularly below the drip line but it's a good idea to get some above it as well. Now. If we don't manage these systems properly, the drip line is below the ground surface, it's out of sight, it's out of mind. But if we over irrigate, we're going to create a pattern that I just showed you, uh, and we're going to potentially move water out to the bottom. And any kind of nitrogen that's in this water pattern that you see here um, can be transported by that water out of the profile and, and into the groundwater. So we're just as able to do it with a drip line as we are others. Um, but if we manage them properly, we're not going to have that issue. The other thing I want you to notice about this particular image is that all this soil up above these, uh, if we irrigate properly, the soil up above is dry, which means that when it rains, we've got some storage capacity here uh, that, that will uh, need to be filled up before we move more water down through the profile. And this is really key to the, 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 the real uh, benefit of, of subsurface surface drip irrigation in that we put this water below the soil surface. We don't have the surface wetted. If we get wet soil on the surface, we probably irrigated too long. 
Uh, in fact, we've irrigated too long. Uh, and then, because we're not irrigating the soil surface, uh, these soils can dry out, and the, when we get a rainfall event, we're going to be able to store that water in the profile. Finally, by not irrigating the soil surface here, we're not getting as much uh, water evaporating off the surface either. So overall, kind of a uh, conservation of water potential for drip line. Uh, but again, just because they're out of sight, out of mind, does not mean we don't have to manage them properly. And the amount of water we apply per event is significantly less than what we would with a center pivot on the surface because of it. Because uh, if we put on too much water here, we're going to make this pattern be too big and we're going to uh, flush water down through the profile. The one, of the one of the main issues related to uh, subsurface drip irrigation system uh, in terms of longevity uh, is the chewing that you see here in this particular image uh, and the two uh, rodents that you see and the images on here down at the bottom. As we look at this, th these particular uh, rodents uh, over winter at about the same depth as some of our, our drip lines uh, and they like to chew and so you'll see this kind of thing. If we don't fix this, this creates an area where uh, we may in fact have, uh, well we will have non-uniform water application and we'll have a lot of extra water applied so we're going to have the potential of moving water through the profile. And in the right scenario, these particular rodents can chew out a fairly long length of, of tape uh, and it's really critical that we find out where these holes are. And that's really where the water meter and the pressure gauges at the pump outlet come into play. Because when we have holes like this, it's going to show up with a pressure reduction and it's going to show up with a flow rate increase if our water meter and everything else is working properly.